Shahab, and I'm the director of the Visual Cultures Program at the American University in Cairo. On behalf of AUC, I would like to welcome you to our historic Tahrir campus. We are honored to host as many as 60 artists, researchers, thinkers, and academics from over 35 countries. To highlight the importance of such an event in an ancient city like Cairo, your presence, whether by delivering a paper in the coming three days or by participating with an artwork at the exhibition, will hopefully shed light on new art forms for the people in Cairo, within our AUC community, and also to our student body in the art, film, and design programs. We are hoping that an event like Cairotronica will bridge the gap between developed and developing. It will open minds to new possibilities, adventures, and it will encourage collaborations across the region, the continent, and hopefully the globe. I would like to thank our artists and speakers who have traveled long distances from the four corners of the globe to be with us today. I would like to also thank our local artists and speakers for being here. Our gratitude is extended to all of our um, local cultural operators for making this event possible. Finally, I am very thankful to the Chirotronica team who has worked uh, really hard and invested very long hours under challenging circumstances, as I'm sure you all know, to make this event possible. I hope you will enjoy Chirotronica, um, the program, our speakers these coming three days, and I will give the floor to Chirotronica's director, Haysam Nawar. challenge of collectivity. Um, quite a lot of text will appear, which is not characteristic of my presentations, but I thought language-wise it might be quite useful to do that. Um, and I just sort of call it a challenge because I think we're well into the collective uh, era. Um, we've had many decades now of being online and so on and so forth, and lots of other connectivities are arising, and, um, uh, and I think they're challenging. I think there is a teleology at work. I think there is a sort of necessity, if you like, in nature um, that has brought about uh, this, this, this moment, uh, a kind of evolutionary step forward of connectivity, which is also tied up with 
the multiple identities that we're beginning to develop for, our, uh, for each one of us. Um, and uh, I, in that sense, I suppose we could talk about the universe being connected. But I thought I'd start the way I always start these talks. And those of you who've known it before know that I really have to identify um, this situation as I see it. Um, our planet is telematic now. Our media is moist by moist. I mean very simply that convergence of dry, silicon dry computational systems and wet biological processes. And as they converge, as they are doing in so this moist media um, becomes something that we can work with. Um, our mind is technoetic, the word technoetic is one I created from the Greek techne and noeticos, meaning techne in terms of art and, and, and making stuff, uh, and noeticos meaning consciousness. Um, and uh, uh, it seems to me that that really is, is fundamentally what art is all about now. Um, this, Our sensorium is extended. Uh, we know that uh, we have a very long reach. We know that we see further, we see deeper, we think. I don't know if we think faster, but we multitask in a way that was completely unknown uh, just a few uh, decades ago. Our identity is multiple. I mean, social media alone has our avatars and personas being changed almost daily and, uh, uh, and so forth. The body is undoubtedly transformable, I mean, not simply through the media that we use, but through all the developments in physics and science and so on. Our art is essentially syncretic now. We don't have movements anymore, not in our world. And they used to have things like postmodern and modern and all those sort of funny old things. We don't have that. Everything is syncretic. That is to say, um, we work as a whole, uh, but all the differences are maintained. Um, and uh, our substrate, well, is not yet nano, but I think it's getting there. I think all the implications of what we do with the new media that we employ will have their readout 20 or 30 years hence in the material world when we actually do manage to control uh, material substances at the nano level. At the moment, we're still, with respect to my great friends who are involved in it, at the playing level. Uh, there will be a time when, for example, all that big island of waste in the ocean will be simply nano-transformed into useful and completely new and original material. But that's, that's for the future. But our re reality is variable. I mean, we move in and out of virtual worlds, um, online worlds, so-called physical, the real world and so on, back and forth with, with no problem. There used to be a time where I suppose about 10 years ago, so say, I'm going to go into virtual reality now, or I'm going to go online now, but we don't go anything, we just are constantly in these variable realities uh, of whether they are networked uh, or not. But the most urgent necessity, I think, at the moment, I call it eco-necessity, is that we start redesigning ourselves. We've passed that old sort of idea that uh, what we are is what we're, what we're given. Uh, what we're told we are, um, and what we're given to um, We have no time for that. We want to design ourselves, we want to remake ourselves, we want to rethink what a person is, and we're damn well going to do it. Um, so there's most of me, I thought I'd introduce these terms, to be clear, uh, you know, new, lang new forms of behavior that we're developing, new kinds of social interaction, call for new vocabulary. So most media was obviously one. The hypercortex is something we need not just to, to, to name, but to talk about. The consequences of thought and consciousness um, within a networked environment becomes something quite other. Um, and our, the way I think we're developing a new faculty, uh, the faculty of cyberception, as I say, um, both perception and cognition are enhanced by the transpersonal technology of these global networks, we see deeper into matter, further into space, it makes the invisible visible, we're hyperlinked, multitasking, consciousness is reframed, and, and this is going to be part of what I'm talking about, there is a bridge to spiritual domains, even within the media that we use. And syncretism, uh, uh, I've talked about, um, 
see likeness in unlike things, um, and it speeds up techno evolution, it destabilizes orthodoxy, is a really important task for the artist. It challenges representation, it fights dogma, it confronts materialism, it demands participation, it hybridizes identity, it smooths social interaction, and it reorders time and space. I mean, what more do you want? <laughs> no, but I would say this is this is what happens when I think when different ideologies, different technologies, different attitudes, different personas come together, working in a not a, in a, in a collection, in, not, not in a collective whole, but, but where identity is maintained, but wholeness uh, is is guaranteed and developed, and that is effective in the world. So the challenge of connectivity with digital technology, telematic connectivity, and moist media, including, as I will be talking later, the chemistry of the brain, which is an important attribute of this. We artists are challenged to reposition ourselves metaphysically and aesthetically, in art as in life. The breadth of our connectivity defines the depth of our humanity, and the vision we bring to our role will be critical in the coming decades, not only in the way we comprehend our connectivity, but the ways in which we choose to live it. So we do have a responsibility. And I, I, coined, I use this term um, from E.M. Forster, the, the novelist, only connect. They didn't quite mean it in the sense that, that we mean it. Um, but it is an imperative that governs the development of digital art, uh, as well as cultural convention and the evolution of social media. And it has implications for education, for planning, urban planning, and for human relations that are shared across the world. I think when we enter into this field of new media art, we do take on a certain kind of responsibility. It ain't just having like aesthetic fun. There are implications to all the work, to all the images, to all the performances, to all the interactions that we're responsible for, in my view. Um, and in exploring these issues, whether in celebrating ideological or aesthetic mode, any of those modes apply, I think, to us as artists, we recognize that artists and thinkers must push their practice beyond the conventions of habit into unknown territories of mind and matter. And I say that because, you know, <clears throat> not for those present here, but uh, I'm sure, and, and for many, many, many of my colleagues and people that I know around the world, but for, for a lot of artists, and in fact for many artists now who just reach out to the computer, it's a little bit like action painting was in 30 years ago. You just like get the stuff together and bang it together. You get bright lights and pretty pictures. And hey, it's an immediate art. Um, and of course, what we are demanding uh, is that we go into unknown territories, that we push, we absolutely push uh, the field as far as it can go. Now, a very, very important aspect of networking, which is my subject, is <clears throat> the networking in nature. And Lynn Margulis stands up not just as it were, against Darwin, uh, but against um, uh, the whole corporate culture. Which is, of course, Darwinian, absolutely, and depends on the thuggery that is involved in uh, the survival of the fittest. She takes a completely different view um, about nature and says, life did not take over the globe by combat, but by networking. And we evolved more by corporate For those of you unfamiliar with her work and thinking, I really recommend her point of view with regard to life and its implications for society. But on the other hand, <clears throat> if Darwin is to be useful, it may be in reminding us that evolution never rests. We're certainly not at the end of the road in our development. Our present state of distributed mind will doubtless lead to the evolution of a distributed body. I'm not thinking here of virtual bodies or telematic presences, they've already arrived. I'm looking to organic, physical extensions through the agency of molecular printing or some such development on the material level. This will put meat on the multiple self that we've already acquired. I think there is, if we're talking art, science, which was a very fashionable thing to do for the last five years, ten years, um, let's look at art biology and let's look at the way that printing might print out actual physical extensions. I'm not talking about reproducing organs, you know, the heart or arm or something, but 
new kinds of physical presences which are instrumental on our part, extensions of ourselves, but distributed um, uh, across great dis distances. So really, this is really to talk about art as an organism. And in biology, just to remind you, an organism is any contiguous living system capable of response to stimuli, reproduction, growth, development, and homeostasis as a stable hold. And I think we, in our field, we can talk about the telematic organism, uh, a connective system that exhibits all these behaviors. So I think talking about all the entities related to our practice, whether we're talking about the old idea of art schools or universities, uh, artists, uh, uh, groups or whatsoever, as well as the actual, um, how to say, ensemble of tools and expertise that goes together to make work, particularly collaborative work. It's useful to have, I think, the metaphor of the organism to understand the behaviors that might be involved. And as well, I would like to say the solid objective world that we see is a representation at another level of resolution of the oscillating immateriality that we recognize as constituting quantum phenomena. Aesthetics and metaphysics are closely aligned. Where metaphysics examines the nature of reality, including the relationship between mind and matter, aesthetics deals with beauty and the integrity of meaning. But reality, beauty, and meaning are not independent of our participation in their construction and their representation, another responsibility of the artist. Both the artist and the scientist are central in these processes of interpretation, mediation, and creation. So just to draw your attention to the work of the physicists who um, are defining quantum, the quantum world for us. Um, here we have, for example, Hans-Peter Dürer, um, uh, the Max Planck Institute, saying that quantum physics reveals that matter is not composed of matter, but reality is mere potentiality. Now that corresponds very much to the way that much of our digital uh, new media work is produced, where the work itself is not the work itself. The work itself um, uh, permits the viewer to interact with it, to generate meaning or to generate change, to generate new images or whatsoever. This, that's interaction uh, guarantees that the work is never stable, is never static, is never fixed. Uh, and for that reason uh, is open to growth and development through the participation of the viewer in the way that Hans Peter Dorr and many other quantum physicists are arguing meta the metaphysics. Um, but uh, it seems to me neuroscience, which is very fashionable at the moment, needs frequently to be reminded, in my view, that the brain is an organ of access to consciousness, not its source, just as the heart uh, is an organ of thought, not simply its reflection. Uh, of course, we in the West, uh, anyway, um, certainly seem to think that the meat here generates consciousness, and it's led us into lots of uh, difficulties, it seems to me, and blind alleys. And here are the, here are the criminals, here are the culpable <laughs> members of the materialist, fundamentalist materialist regime, who, um, you know, underwrite capitalism, underwrite all the materialism that um, fills our uh, you know, fills our lives. So Dawkins, Sam Harris, Daniel Dennett, the beloved Daniel Dennett was, I think he was in uh, Tucson again last week. Is that right? Huh? No, <laughs> there was a big consciousness conference there. He usually stalks that. Uh, they're all fundamentalists, and um, and science, of course, has much to say about that which is invisible to the unaided eye or in its interpretative data visualization. But speculation beyond the norms of so-called reasonable discourse, as science would define it, is verboten, forbidden, either forcibly, as with government funding inhibitions, or more gently through the Western philosophical reticence, whereof one cannot speak thereof, one must be silent. The field of knowledge in which this repressive superiority of science is exerted can be summed up in one word, the word is blanked out here, consciousness, meaning that all that we encounter in the noetic sphere that is variously acknowledged or dismissed as spiritual, psychic, extracentry, or occult. <sighs> Dangerous <laughs> words, silly words, mustn't use those in polite society. I'm going to a lot, I'm afraid. 
I'd like to also to tell you that, if you are unfamiliar with this, that an organism's information network of biophotons emitted by DNA molecules is parallel technologically by the constant flows of electrons and photons across the body of the planet through our telematic networks. Biophotonic emission is a, a field that those of you interested in the science art connection might want to investigate. Um, it says that, um, that these biophotons um, really are the informational system of the body, telling what to grow where, what to feed, what, and so on and so forth. And uh, examples from organisms and living systems at various levels of the biological hierarchy show that biophoton emission is an exciting area of research with potentials in biology, medicine, pharmacology, and so on. And also, I think, uh, actually, uh, in art. Um, so once again, just to pursue this point, but not too far, um, Max Planck saying, as a man who's devoted his whole life to the most clear-headed science, to the study of matter, I can tell you as a result of my research about atoms this much, there is no matter as such. Um, so immaterial connectedness is something we need to think about, in my view. Uh, and it confers a spiritual dimension on both telematic art and quantum mechanics. Field theory supports the contention that the material body may be a consequence rather than a cause of consciousness, and a technoetic art may locate its ground in this triangulation of connectivity, syncretism, and field theory. Uh, so, well, only connect to two sorts of other kinds of connection. One, both of them close to my heart, though not in time. I mean, the first one, I serve as a, an RAF officer in my national service dealing with flight and control, the behavior of airplanes, really, uh, and getting information at long distances and bringing it together and triangulating the information about a given aircraft's movement from three sources. They're quite opposed to our Western idea of, of the dialogue, of the binary system of arriving at uh, the correct view of something. This is that tripartite view, which many ancient cultures apply, and certainly applied there. You get three different radar stations trying to pinpoint the behavior of an aircraft, and you cross one over the other and the other over there, and finally you reach a point that is near to the truth, uh, as you might get, and then you can take action on that and send up fighters and all that sort of stuff. On the other hand of this slide, you see a 19th, uh, a, 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 a sort of late 19th century table um, of, of people trying to make contact um, outside of this human realm, uh, for better or worse, and, and, uh, and whether or not they, they really succeeded. But the, the whole idea that it's possible um, to have a, a collaborative way in which information can be accessed and transferred in another, a completely other medium, this so-called psychic space, I think it's, it's something which we have in our minds always uh, still when we're engaged uh, in the mechanics of, of, uh, of connectivity with the, the telematics. So um, I just briefly would introduce a little bit of my work only because um, it, it, to the extent that it's about connectivity, these are different stages of the work, but central to it all is the metaphor of the table. Uh, it's the table across which decisions are made, experiences are shared, new ideas are developed. And the table is really the model of connectivity in the digital realm. Uh, we sit around a virtual table effectively, and we share and we participate and so on. And there are various ways in which those tables, whether it's uh, projection uh, from, from the computer and so forth, or whether it's uh, physical elements that could be moved around, or whatsoever, it seems to be the table is an important motif. Um, Oh, we still it. Okay, okay, okay. So I've got to, I've got to move on. I was showing some early work networking in Ali in 1986, first time that we um, actually uh, actually had digital stuff on the international stage. I was a commissioner for the Venice Biennale at that time. We had quite a large show of work. This is um, this is a, a a piece of narrative um, that we developed. Um, dealing with, with the word as the actual construction of the environment in which um, 
in which uh, the work takes place, I've got to move on, I know, and so on. Uh, this is another tabletop thing that I, I, <laughs> I do want to signal that. Hmm? Okay. 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 I do want to signal, though, the importance to me, anyway, of cybernetics um, as a discipline um, behind all of this, this work. These are those key original um, players and key original texts, uh, which I recommend to you. Um, and, of course, to see how up the top left there you have... Okay. I'm uh, sorry. Up top left there you have um, Norbert Wiener, um, who's... Uh, introduced through his book, The Human Use of Human Beings and Cybernetics. Of course, the whole question of cybernetics, the whole idea of cybernetics, which was long established by, by Plato first, and then um, Ampere and various others, the uh, Soviet government, once in 1950 had cybernetics as its main plan uh, for development. But he, he brought it to the public uh, in the 50s, and there he is with a, a mechanism which has some cybernetic elements, and I thought I'd sort of swiftly move across to the Internet of Things, which is where it's all developed, uh, where the material world is, is uh, connected, of course, as well as we human beings being connected, to the extent that uh, we may have to change our behavior, e even in terms of uh, vehicular access and all that sort of stuff. So that's just a kind of this. So really then I'm talking about, you know, uh, with apologies to Ray Kurzweil, it's actually the te technoetic singularity, which is which is near. I think it's uh, that's to say between all ideas about consciousness, um, many of them quite exotic and acceptable to Eastern to um, Western thought, uh, along with the cybernet with the cybernetics and, and technological systems, I think will come together. So I call this cybernetic connectivity. Um, and just to signal that that will involve second order senses. Um, we know the senses of the first order, but there's the second order senses. Guys, you mention any of those um, in a faculty meeting or a business meeting, you're out of it. You've lost. You're not considered sensible or reliable or anything. And yet, hundreds and thousands, of course, millions of people in time and hundreds of thousands of people right across the world still experience and are involved in these behaviours. Uh, so it's a connective universe that I want to talk about. Um, <laughs> That's pretty... no, sorry. Okay. I just have to open this to discussion. You, can you raise your hand if you'd like us to go with the presentation, or you'd rather jeopardize the five minutes of question and answers? I'm personally going for Professor Roy completing his presentation. If you're with me, please raise your hand. Thank you. A little bit educationally, guys, sorry about that. But I think that interstitial creativity um, can be associated with any art practice. Um, which I expect is a practice of many of you, that falls between rather than within the familiar boundaries of accepted genres of art. We all know about um, interdisciplinary <laughs> uh, stuff, but uh, if we talk about transdisciplinary, uh, what kind of structure do we have? And I think it will be cybernetic, uh, technoetic, telematics, and syncretic thinking that will allow us to go into these little areas between disciplines in which new knowledge might be developed. Uh, we do this through the planetary collegium. Many of, some of the members of the collegium are here. We have nodes in, in Switzerland and China and so forth uh, of PhD uh, students who are PhD candidates who are pursuing this uh, technoetic field in, in their different ways. Um, I have a studio in Shanghai which has a BA program which again is, is dealing with cybernetics and. Uh, uh, moist media, cyberception, and so on, uh, in the construction of the four-year program. Um, and I, very quickly, I want to mention, just as a lead-in, working uh, in Korea a few years back at Nabi Center. Um, this was my, the plan that uh, I devised for there. Uh, sort of, uh, it is essentially concerned with networks and new media uh, and interactivity in that way. Uh, and this was the structure. Uh, of that, I won't go through it all, but you, you can see we're trying to um, deal with with memory as well as um, action and practice and integration, as well as seeing that the institution has plenty of wormholes. Very, very important that any any physical institution now concerned with art education has wormholes to other creative centres uh, all over the world. 
Um, and it was, it, I, I mention it only and particularly because um, it's right uh, next to Connectivity City, uh, Songdo City in South Korea, just near, uh, near Seoul, um, which is a smart city in which all the kinds of interactive systems that we could at the moment deal with uh, are applied, seen again, uh, to use the word again, as a living organism. Um, and uh, uh, we could talk more about that, but I wanted to signal that because I think it comes within the scope of our work. And then finally to talk about bioconnectivity with plants. I think we can expect art to develop across two principal axes, te technoetic connectivity and cultural syncretism. Um, and and te technoetic research may syncretize new developments in the chemical mapping of the brain and the mind navigated by plant technology. By plant technology, I'm talking about things like ayahuasca, you'll be familiar with, um, and, um, uh, and other kinds of um, plants that are used in healing, which transform consciousness and are used in many, many cultures, particularly in my experience in Brazil, um, uh, as well as the history of artists and scientists looking at the behavior and the connectivity of plants between plants, this is one of our graduates, Guto Nobrega, um, dealing with um, a, a breath and the relationship to plant communication and so forth. Um, and of course that, that famous old secret life of plants, um, which um, or, you know, was, was very much everything we were talking about many years ago, the way that you can talk to and, and there's talking between plants. So this, I call this chemical connectivity, because consciousness remains the grand enigma in science, despite the best efforts of neuroscience. The future seems to lie in integrating our understanding of the chemistry of the brain with the electronic and digital technologies of communication and cyberception. So we're talking about auto-connectivity, I said earlier without going into it now, we're no longer a self-organism, we have many selves, and the consequences of connectivity are new behaviours, new systems, new structures, new language and new realities. And Consciousness Reframed, which is the title of um, the next conference that we're holding, uh, if I can advertise it here, <laughs> which hopefully some of you can come to, which is in Shanghai, which is called Presumptive Predications Art of the Future. Thank you, and I'm sorry I overran my time. Thank you very much.